Hello, welcome everyone to our universal uh, render pipeline talk. And I'm Philippe Lira, I'm a graphics programmer in Unity. And I'm Andre McGrail, I'm a technical artist at Unity. And today we're gonna talk about the universal render pipeline. So over the past couple of years, Unity transitioned to a new rendering design. Uh, I like to think of this as a programmable engine. Similar to how GPUs allow to program the graphics pipeline, Unity today allow developers to program large parts of its rendering pipeline. We did this by exposing a C-sharp rendering API layer that can be uh, used to create render pipelines and plug it into Unity. We call this rendering API layer scriptable render pipeline. This is open source and it's available in, this, in the following GitHub project. So now developers, they can create custom rendering pipeline solutions and, they, and tell Unity to use it. Although this is really nice, if we only did this, we will not serve most of our developers. And the reason is because now we have a gap between the built-in render pipeline solution, which is still available to use, but that pipeline has several limitations. It is a black box, it's open, uh, it's closed source, uh, it has limited customization possibilities and performance doesn't scale so well. On the other hand, you have a custom rendering pipeline solution, but in order to create one, it requires deep graphics knowledge and a lot of effort. So how do we fill this gap? What we did was to introduce two new rendering solutions out of the box with Unity. These rendering solutions, they are built on top of this scriptable render pipeline API, and it's available for you today. The high definition render pipeline is focused on delivering performance and high fidelity graphics on high end platforms, and the universal render pipeline is the solution that we're gonna talk about today. With the universal render pipeline, you get better graphics and better performance than the built, previous built-in render solution. It also supports a wide range of platforms. This is a solution to develop once and deploy everywhere. It also improves in terms of extensibility and ease to use compared to the previous rendering solution. If you're using scriptal render pipelines before, you might be already familiar with the lightweight render pipeline. So what happened? The universal render pipeline is a continuation of lightweight render pipeline. We renamed it because it better describes the purpose and the scope of this render pipeline, which is to deliver beautiful graphics and best in class performance in several platforms. When you upgrade to 19.3, um, your project, and if you're using lightweight render pipeline, your project will be upgraded to universal render pipeline. Shaders, custom shaders, scripts, and assemblies will update automatically. Uh, you only we, you only be required to do some manual upgrade if you're doing uh, if you need to update shader paths. Universal render pipeline is going to be supported on 19.4 LTS version of Unity. So that means from 19 to 4, two year support for you. So let's look at what's new in 1903 and the universal render pipeline. So the render pipeline supports a forward renderer. This forward renderer uh, cool lights per object and it shades the lights uh, in a single path. That means that when, when you render your objects, it evaluates all of the lights once. It doesn't add more render uh, draw calls uh, to your game because you have more lights. Uh, so because of this, the pipeline has to set up some global light data globally um, and access this from the shaders in, the, in, the, in a light loop. And because of this, there are some light limits. So we increase the light limits in universal render pipeline. Now you can achieve eight lights per object uh, except in GLS2 that the limit is, to, is still full. And you can achieve up to 256 global light data per camera. Uh, the limit is further reduced in mobile uh, to 32, and that is because of performance. The pipeline now also supports shading additional direction lights, so you can use fill lights with uh, universal render pipeline now. 
It also supports a 2D uh, lit renderer. Um, and what's new in the 2D renderer now is that it supports real-time shadows and post-processing. And speaking of post-processing, now we have a new post-processing post stack that is built into Universal Render Pipeline. This allows better integration with the pipeline. So now if you look at the camera inspector, you can enable post by toggling an, this new setting on the rendering category. When you do that, it exposes you additional uh, configuration for post. And when you enable post, now the scene view, the gizmos in scene view will feed back to you this uh, little icon on the bottom left of the camera telling that this camera has post processing enabled. We also expose different modes to, to do color grading. Now you can do color grading in HDR or LDR. So Bodotech, it still delivers beautiful graphics while doing LDR color grading. So color grading happ happens after tone mapping, and this allows you better performance while still keeping quality. And you can also configure the lookup table size for better precision and better performance of color grading. The new post-processing stack is volume-based, and that means that you can still do, um, apply post-processing globally, but now you can select the mode to be local, and when you do that, you can add colliders to your scene. These colliders, they work as volumes, and the camera can transition between different volumes, and when, the, when it transitions uh, between different volumes, it can apply different post-processing effects. You can, you can control the, how the camera blends the post-processing between these volumes as well. This uh, post-processing st stack add new post-processing effects. Uh, for instance, Panini projection and camera motion blur. And here's the post-processing settings that it supports. Uh, new post-processing stack doesn't yet support custom uh, written uh, effects but it's on a roadmap to be, the, to be added support soon. So let's take a look at performance differences between the PPV2, which was the previous stack, and PPV3. So these, these numbers are frame time on, uh, actually, sorry, FX time on a Nintendo Switch, and we can see uh, across the board that it's more optimized. And also, if you look at the Bloom Pyramid, plus apply, this is a performance increase at about of 3x. We also introduced a new Gaussian depth of field mode that improves performance over the Bucket depth of field mode, which is still available. Post-processing 2 is now deprecated with Universal Brand Pipeline. When you upgrade to Universal, you have to upgrade your post-processing effects. Universal Render Pipeline uh, supports the latest artist tools, and that includes Shader Graph. And Shader Graph, as you may already be familiar, is this node-based uh, tool that generates uh, shaders. And with Shader Graph, now you can control shader precision nodes, uh, so you can change between half precision and full flow precision. This is uh, especially important for mobile, for performance. Uh, you can define your own shader keywords, and you can define custom function nodes. In custom function nodes, you can write custom HLSL, and this allows you to create custom lighting models with Shader Graph. Shader Graph is supported in the 3D forward renderer and the 2D renderer, both with lit and unlit graphs. Another tool is VFX Graph, and VFX Graph allows you to create compute-based particle effects. And currently, VFX Graph is supported for unlit particles in Universal, and we are adding support soon to lit particles with VFX Graph as well. So now, with the render pipeline, we improved the camera inspector to be categorizing and organizing the settings that are relevant to each other in these categories. On the projection, you find all of the physical camera properties. Um, on the rendering, you find things like curling, post-processing, and the renderer that the camera uses. Under environment, you're going to find volume-based settings uh, that affect your camera. And under output, you configure the target and format that this camera renders to. 
We also have new improved light gizmos. So now we have colored gizmos feedback, feedbacking the light color. And these light gizmos now also have a depth feedback, so the gizmos will fade away if they're occluded by a uh, scene object in the scene. We exposed to control inner spot angle values, and this allows you to achieve either for artistic reasons a hard cutoff for spotlights or to control the smooth transition of the spotlight fall off. Uh, now when you drag, hand, you can see handles in the scene view as well, outputting the same values that you see in the spectre. With Universal Render Pipeline, you get a unified place to set all of the quality for your project. And this is the pipeline asset. Uh, it's also categorized for different uh, settings. And uh, Universal Render Pipeline, it's explicit. What you ask here is what you get. So you're not going to fall into problems that uh, these settings uh, change because you build it to a Android or iOS device. However, it's important to say that when you upgrade from, we provide some upgraders to build, to upgrade from the built in to universal. They mostly upgrade your project materials, but they don't upgrade quality. So if you're converting your project, you have to be aware that you have to match the quality settings yourself. Otherwise, you might get uh, different performance uh, uh, variations because universal is doing better quality by default. So now we introduced a new field in the quality settings that you can set a render pipeline there. And this allows you to configure a render pipeline asset per quality. This is how you can scale between different platforms. So performance is a continuous work and we put a lot of effort into it in Universal Render Pipeline. And with 19.3, we further improved performance. This was uh, required to be able to achieve high frame rates in the boat attack demo for both mobiles and consoles. We also are interested in comparing the performance of the built-in pipeline and universal render pipeline. So we took this uh, polygon farm scene by Sinti Studios and converted it to universal render pipeline. So let's look at how these two scenes compare. Here's the screenshot comparisons of the both pipelines. Uh, you might notice that it's a slight difference, and that is coming mostly because there's different post-processing stacks. Universal now has a built-in PPV3 stack. Um, and with Universal Render Pipeline, we're profiled it on both projects on iPhone 6S, and uh, we were able to achieve 60 frames per second, while this was not possible before with built-in render pipeline. So you might ask, so what's happening here? Okay, so let's take a look at some numbers in this specific scene. So if you look at CPU and GPU, uh, you, with universal render pipeline, you get uh, lower numbers here, which is better. Uh, and that's why we're able to achieve 60 FPS. And if you look at some scene stats, the first thing that you're going to no notice is that uh, with Universal, you have the same scene and the same things, but with less raw cost. The reason is that Universal, like I said before, is shading all the lights with a single, uh, it's rendering the ob objects once and evaluating the lights in the shader. So it loops in the shader. While built-in pipeline is shading objects uh, with a new render pass. So it's a loop in terms of draw calls to evaluate each light. This not only increases draw calls, but it also increases the overdraw and the amount of times, which is the amount of times you write to the, uh, to the pixel to composite the effects of the additional lights. You also notice that we have significantly reduced the number of patches. And when rendering objects in Unity, we need to set some render state or some rendering data for that specific object. This thing is basically like the material properties that it has, the uh, textures, and the shader itself. So we need to upload this data to the GPU. And this is costly. If we're updating this every draw call, it would incur in a CPU overhead that's too much. So what we do in Unity is we group objects that have the same render state together, so we minimize the render state changes. And this is what we call batching. 
In the universal render pipeline, we introduced a new batching system that allows the game to be, to be batched per shader. So that means if you have two different materials, but they use the same shader, it means that they can batch together. While in built-in render pipeline, that was not possible before. You had to resort to some, if you're rendering multiple objects with different colors or material properties, you had to resort to these material property blocks to be able to, um, to get some more performance gains here. So with the universal render pipeline, the batcher does that for you. And the last but still very important metric is bandwidth. So with this project, we reduced bandwidth uh, uh, by about a half. If, you, if you're looking, well, this number is different from the keynote, and it's because the keynote it used the, uh, a, a version of the pipeline that's just before the latest version, and we further improved the, the performance on the same scene. And bandwidth is the amount of memory that you flush and read from the main memory. It's important because in mobile devices, this controls, uh, this, this incurs in more power, and more power incurs in more overheat. And overheating causes the devices to do passive culling, which is throttling down the CPU and GPU times. So overall, this uh, a more bandwidth incurs in performance degradation of your game. And if you look at bandwidth across the frame, both pipelines, in, they're, they're doing, in this scene, they were like matched to do the same thing. So they're both doing like 2K shadow maps. They're doing a depth pre-pass to be able to resolve those shadow maps in screen space, rendering the game and applying post-processing. So the performance in terms of bandwidth gains is coming here because of several things. One is the pipeline, uh, minimizes the render target switches. It kind of batches the render targets together to minimize the amount it switches and it causes more load and store uh, to, the, to the main memory. Other thing is that it do more optimized load and store operations. So if you take a look at post-processing, in post-processing we have several effects being uh, combined, like blue, a bloom pyramid. And we know that we're writing the entire pixels. So we know we don't have to load those, those pixels to entire memory. Also, at some cases, when we know it's a final rendering pass, we don't have to store some information back to the main memory because it's not used, for instance, like depth. And another thing you can look at is the final blip pass is not, in, the, in this particular scene, it's not there. Uh, and the reason it, it is because it's combined with post-processing. So we combine these two passes together to be able to be more lean in terms of bandwidth. Uh, you can also look at all the performance projects that are available publicly. Uh, these, uh, these are simple benchmark scenes, uh, and you can, can check this GitHub. There's benchmark scenes with same setup between the universal and built-in render pipeline. Okay, so hopefully now we, we uh, motivated you to try Universal Render Pipeline and, and convinced convince you that it's a better um, option than the built-in render. But one question that you might ask is, if the, well, the, if you look back at the reasoning that we introduced the script with Render Pipeline, it's because it's very hard to deliver a single solution that works fast everywhere. And then you may ask, well, if Universal, is um, targeting all platforms, won't you fall back to the same issues as the built-in renderer? And that's a valid question, so, and I'll answer that. Um, so the first, first thing to note is this is open source. Uh, it's already good. You can change the pipeline source. If you need, you can tweak it. But changing the source is not enough. So we designed new universal render pipeline to be a modular, modular and extensible architecture. So we introduced the concept of a scriptable renderer. And the renderers can be plugged into the universal render pipeline and change rendering the same way you can plug universal into Unity. A renderer is basically responsible for defining the, a light, light culling strategy. So it could be something like, Maybe it's culling per object. No, maybe it's culling a tile. It's a tile cluster base that we call the lights on the GPU. You choose it, and you can override it if you want. 
Uh, and it's also responsible for defining the features in terms of render passes. So developers now can create custom renders for universal render pipeline, and all of the renders that we provide to you out of the box are built on top of this particular render API as well. But not only that, you can also extend the built-in uh, the, the pipelines that the renders that we provide with Universal with additional render paths to achieve more effects. So if, if we take a look at the loop or high-level loop of Universal Render Pipeline, this is what it at a very high level does. And so we introduce you some pipeline callbacks that you can register and can be used to set some per frame and per, per camera shaded data. You can also use it to inject or render additional procedural cameras. And this is what Bird Attack does to render planar reflections, for instance. These parts of the pipeline, they are over-readable if you change uh, or implement a custom renderer for the pipeline. And these parts of the pipeline, they're fixed, and you cannot change them. And if you, you, you can only change them if you change either the universal or the Unity source code. So the very first big, big block in terms of the renderer is this setup culling parameters in culling path. So when you do a, a custom render, you can configure Unity, this culling parameters uh, data, that it might be like, hey, Unity, call lights for objects for me. Or, hey, Unity, don't call lights per object, because I'm doing that on a compute shader. Um, you can configure like culling for shadow casters, reflection probes, and so on. You can control the shadow distance to, to, to better control how we could shadow casters. Uh, and you can customize culling matrices and even add more culling, uh, culling planes to the culling system. Once this culling parameters is provided, it's passed to the culling system, this is a black box now and it returns you some culling results. It's basically like it tells you the amount of lights that you have visible, the amount of objects, and the amount of uh, reflection probes or light probes. So the next part in the pipeline is to flatten some data, rendering data, that's going to be used for the renderer. And the way we flatten this is by getting different settings together and combining in, in, in one place. So first, like, we listen to the calling results. We have to know how many lights we need to shade. The other, the other settings come from the camera data and quality settings. And we even list to platform-specific GPU capabilities here. Because, for instance, like depending on the GPU, we might sort objects differently. So once this data is flattened, it's all that the renderer needs. You don't have to worry about the platform you're rendering anymore. The renderer takes this rendering data, and it, 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 it does some action on it. And the action is to generate render passes. So render passes are the building blocks of a renderer. It's how these are logical render passes that you describe how to composite the effects on your frame. So each renderer, like a forward renderer, a 2D renderer, and a deferred renderer, they will inject some render passes that might vary. And they'll have like what we call the default render passes that come with this renderer. But you can also add features to your renderer. And the features are custom features that we write. And these features are just mechanisms to inject more render passes into the renderer. Once the render passes are constructed, the renderer executes, and then it outputs a final image. So it's all good to talk about this, but how about we look this in the editor? And Andre will be showing an editor, but I just want to say that this project that Andre is showing is also available publicly in this GitHub. Okay, so this is the project from the GitHub link. It's got a couple of examples in here. Uh, namely, there's a first-person camera uh, setup, so you know, weapon rendering at a different field of view. There's an outline tune shading kind of effect done by either post-processing or uh, rendering another hull kind of version of the object. Um, but for this little demo here, I'm just going to show an effect where we want to get the character rendering behind an object. So if they move behind something, we can still see a kind of silhouette of them. 
Um, so first things first, anyway, I'm going to show, for those of you that might have used Lightweight Render Pipeline, just a bit of a difference of how the Render Pipeline asset itself and the render is a kind of set up and connected. So if we go down here into the project view and go Create, Rendering, Universal Render Pipeline, we'll now see that there is a pipeline asset here with brackets forward renderer. What this will do is actually create your render pipeline asset that is set up with the forward renderer ready to go and connected. In the future, once we have our deferred renderer ready, we'll also have a deferred renderer set up here so that straight off the bat, you can go straight into a setup with deferred rendering rather than having to kind of edit something after the fact. So 2D will also appear here or ready to go. If we create this now, uh, it goes into the naming. If I just enter this, we'll see that two assets were actually created. So here we have our render pipeline asset. Um, this is very much similar to how it was in lightweight render pipeline, but up the top now, instead of ha having a essentially a renderer type, we now have a list of renderers. This is a very convenient way to be able to keep track of all the renderers that you're going to keep or want to switch to in your project. And you can have these set up on cameras, or you can set up, uh, switch these at runtime or whatever. Um, and I'll get into that in a little bit. So here, we realize this is the actual second asset that got created. And if we go to this, here we can either select it here, double click, or we've got this little cog button here that will just take us straight to the asset. Uh, and this is just a bare bones, straight off the bat, default forward renderer. So nothing's been set up differently here. It's just uh, one that's ready to go if you want to start customizing some effects on it. So I'll just get rid of these because I won't be using these ones. Uh, but here is essentially one that was already created. There's no real difference here apart from it's got some settings changed uh, and it's named Occlusion Demo Completed, even though it's not, and we're going to complete it now. So here we have a forward renderer. Uh, this one's all default, obviously straight off the bat that we made before. So I'm going to make a new one because I want to actually create a new one and override what is currently existing. So we can do this by going right click, create, rendering, universal render pipeline again. And here we've got a forward renderer. So this is also how you can create a 2D renderer and assign that into the pipeline asset and then you'll be using the 2D renderer. But for this example, I just want a new forward renderer and we'll just call this uh, demo effect. Now, we want to assign this to our pipeline asset that we're using. So up here, in the forward renderer, I'm just going to drag this demo effect renderer, replace the existing one. Now, if we have a look at what this actual demo is doing, there's just a couple of little characters. They run around. Uh, there's these buildings, and they get hidden behind them. So this is a perfect little example where we go, oh, wow, we might want to see our units behind an object still. And to create a, a, an effect for this, you know, we could do with another shader, but let's try using this renderer feature system. So to start with, um, in Universal Render Pipeline, uh, if we select our renderer, we've got a list of render features here. And these are essentially the scriptable render passes that Felipe talked about. The renderer feature is just a way of handling the data that might be associated with them. And you can also have multiple renderer passes inside a renderer feature. Here, we ship one renderer feature with Universal RP, and that is uh, render objects. Um, in this project, there are two additional render features that we've got, uh, full screen quad and a blit. I won't go into those for this demo, but you feel free to pull down this project and have a look at what they do. So I want to render objects, because I want to re-render this character behind objects. So we've got a new render objects uh, pass here, and I'm just going to change the name to uh, dither. So we're going to create like a dither effect where this character goes behind objects. Now, if we open up the filters, this is kind of like a filtering out which object we actually want to render. And by default, off the bat, we are not rendering anything. So we want to choose a character here. And this is just to match up with uh, these little mage characters here. We've got set to the layer character. This is a way that we can pick up and choose what we want to render with this render objects pass. So now I'm rendering the character again, but I actually want to render him with a different material. So we have some overrides, and there is a material slot here that we can give it a material that we want all these objects to get rendered with, regardless of what they had before. And we have a dither material here, and this is just a, a shader graph shader that kind of creates a screen space dither effect. 
So now we see, well, it's rendering over our character, right? Obviously, it just goes on top and it's rendering the same character again with a different shader. This isn't what we want. We want to make sure if we're behind an object, so our depth is greater, that we actually want to render the dither effect there. We don't want to be rendering it when it's out in front. So <coughs> let's get to a nice shot here where we've got the building <laughs> in front of the uh, character. And here we've got also some other overrides. Uh, there's depth sensor on camera. In this example, we want to override the depth. And our depth test is essentially our, you know, our check to see whether it's in front or behind and whether we should render those pixels or not. So we'll change that to greater. And now, if our character is greater depth than the current pixels already there, we will render them. Great. Now we've got this effect where the character behind an object, rendering the dither effect, and not in front of it, it's rendering like this. Now, you might see there's some you know, glitchiness going on. It doesn't look that great. And that's because the character is actually rendering, obviously, behind itself. So if we get a staff in front of him, we get the same effect, or this like little overlap here on his coat. And we don't want this. This, is, this doesn't look good. It's great for when it's behind fully, but we still want our character to look normal when he's out and about. So this is where we can actually tell the uh, default uh, opaque paths to not render the character, and instead we'll control rendering it later again after the opaques, uh, after our dither render feature is gone. So to do that, up here we've got a default layer mask. So this is a kind of a global override for what the renderer should render, and we can tell it not to worry about rendering the character at all. So now we've lost our character. We've still got him behind, but we need to add another render object so he still comes through. So let's go down here. We'll collapse this one for now, so we're done with it. And now let's add a second render objects. And where we can call this one character, we want to choose our character layer. And that's pretty much it. So we look at that, great, cool. Now we've got our character back here. If he goes behind something, huh, that's a bit different than before. We realize now he's getting coloring from uh, his, his original material. What's happening here is actually the dither effect will render first. It's rendering to screen. It's checking if its depth is greater. If it is, it'll render itself. It's also rendering its depth values. So its depth values are now rendering in, saying these pixels are now behind the building. And when we go to render the character, then the character goes, wow, those pixels are far enough behind this, and I'm going to render. We don't want this. So we need to do a little bit more tweaks to our dither pass here. And where we've got our depth override, uh, we've actually got an option to uh, tell it to write to depth. And here we don't want, oh, no, that's the wrong one, bad. Here, we don't want our dither to be writing to the depth. This way, we've still got the original depth values of the tower. That means when we go to render our character normally, it goes, wow, these pixels are behind. We're not going to bother rendering them. Now, if we go back to game view, check this in play, we'll see these guys run around and get behind things. So another thing you might want to do, which we have uh, control over, is say, OK, that's good. But it's kind of distracting in the, in the scene view here. And you know, I don't want this to be happening all the time while I'm authoring my scene. I don't want these like transparent guys popping up everywhere. Um, I like it for my game view. So what we can do is actually get this renderer to only be used on a specific camera. And a way to do this is if we go back to our render pipeline asset, where we have our list of renderers, we can add a second one here. And what this does, first off, it just duplicates the same reference. But you can add up to 10 of these, and these are essentially available at runtime to be switching between or using on many different cameras. So I'm going to set back this, uh, this new second one that I've made. I'm going to go back to our forward renderer. You'll see the effect's still happening. But that's because here on the side, we've got this little set default button. Here we can see that the first uh, entry in our list, our demo effects that we just set up with the dither, is set to the default. So now we'll change that. And we want the, the, the bare bones uh, forward renderer to be our default. It's used on every camera that we've got. So now our effect goes away. So what we want to do is now select our main camera. 
And for this, uh, you'll see we've got some categories now. It's all been uh, organized a bit nicer. But under our rendering setting, we have a renderer. Right now, it's set to the default renderer. And then it gives us the name of the renderer. It's the forward renderer that we've got. So this will always pick the default one that you've set on your pipeline asset. If you do the drop down, you'll see a list of the renderers that are on your, for, your uh, render pipeline asset that's currently assigned. Here we actually want to use our demo effect because our forward renderer is now a default one. We want our demo effect to be the one that is valid on our camera. So here we can see it still doesn't work in the scene view. But if we go and run our game, the effect will uh, be used, that render will be used on this camera to render the effect. So this is great, for example, we use this in the other first person uh, like gun example in this project because we squash the perspective of the first person hands. We don't want to have this to happen in the scene view because you end up with a weird gun kind of arms floating around in a different position. Um, so this is a good way to control certain things. So say if you do a planner reflection camera, for example, you can use a different forward renderer there that has specific renderer features that you might need. So these renderer features you can create yourself. Um, we've got an option to kind of make a bare bones one uh, to get you started. So if we go create, rendering, universal render pipeline, and then down to render a feature, let's just call this my render feature. And what this does, I'll just quickly open this. is create a scriptable renderer feature. Now, the scriptable renderer feature, as I said before, is kind of like the, the data handler. It's the, it's the entry that we put into our renderer list. Inside that, we have our scriptable render pass. Now, we can have any number of these in this, which is kind of cool, because you could make a scriptable render feature that injects multiple passes at multiple points throughout the rendering engine. There are three main things you need in here. Um, here you have a configure method, which lets you kind of doing some setup stuff before the rendering uh, kicks in. You've got the execute, which is actually uh, your rendering logic. You know, that's the core stuff you want to be putting in here. You want to be putting your blitz in here. You want to be drawing your objects in here, uh, setting up uh, you know, any kind of rendering stuff you might want, and then clean up. If you've created stuff in the configure, say render targets and such, then you can clean them up in this function here. So we go down here, and then this is the stuff that we need for the uh, renderer feature itself. And here it essentially just creates it. It creates a new version of our custom render pass, which is up here. And here it's presetting the uh, render pass event, which is where the rendering actually gets injected in the universal rendering code. And this is after rendering opaques. For example, on the render objects feature that we've got, this is exposed as a property on uh, the renderer feature, so it can be changed depending on where you want things to render. So this is a way to set up where you know, it gets injected. And then obviously add render passes, so you can enqueue all of your render passes that you may have in this render feature. So if we head back to Unity, the cool thing about this is that it's already uh, pulled into the system, right? It's, uh, if you look at the forward renderer, for example, and the renderer features list, we can open it up and you'll see here that my renderer feature has been added. And this means you can easily just add it in. Right now, obviously, we haven't added any rendering code, so it's going to do nothing. But it's here, and we can name it. And I'll let Felipe carry on. So, um, so yeah, so again, this project is available publicly. You can check it uh, today. And um, so roadmap-wise, we're improving the render pipeline. It's a continuous improvement. Uh, we have a product board that you can get in and provide feedback and vote on features. Uh, if you haven't figured by now, you are actually our bosses, so we, we listen to this, and what you ask, we prioritize and we do. Uh, I just want to say that the camera stacking is a feature that you, you've been asking, and we've been hearing that, and it's in development, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to ship it still uh, very soon this year. 
Uh, and for the next year, we're working on the deferred renderer and to bring parity with the uh, built-in uh, renderer. Uh, so th that means that all of the uh, missing features that you have, they're going to be worked on, on, on next, next year. And beyond next year, we continue to increase the features in the render pipeline uh, with more high-end features. Um, I'd like to uh, thank you and to say um, that we, we also have another talks uh, today, and you're very welcome to join them. Uh, Andre is going to talk about more about how he used the render features in Boat Attack, and that's how uh, actually he'll go in more detail about that. Um, and this presentation is available for you to download and get all of the links that I referenced in this, uh, in this link. Feel free to take a picture of this so you get the link and you can download, it's, it's already there, so you can, you, you, you can see it, uh, and you can see all the other links to the projects that we, we, we talked about today. And we're very happy to take questions. I just want to remind you that if you have a question, we have some microphones, and you can go to these microphones and ask the questions. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, so I'm working on a 2D game that has 3D elements in it. And I would very much like to use the 2D lights on the 2D elements and 3D lights for the rest. Is there a way to do that? Uh, currently, it's not. Uh, if, it is, if we're talking about lit 3D and 2D hybrid lit, it's not possible currently. Um, I'm okay. not sure about the 2D renderer roadmap, but I know it's something that it was brought up to discussion to support a hybrid uh, 2D renderer. But I'm not like even aware if this is closed or when this is happening or not. But uh, for now, it's as far as I know, it's not supported. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi, I have a question about the um, lights because you said uh, the universal render pipeline supports 256 lights per camera. Yeah. But what if you have more lights? How is it uh, defined which are will be active and which uh, will not work? Can you control this? So with, with the current, current package today, uh, it, it just it doesn't sort them because we're discussing about how to sort this. But the solution that we're converging to is to sort these lights per camera. Uh, and we're going to add support to that. So you see, like, based on distance from the camera, the 256 closest ones is the solution that we're aiming for. But it's not, it's not now. So currently now, it's, uh, they, they, they just drop some lights depending on what the engine sends to us. And it's important to see a distinction between the sorting per object. So per object, the eight per object, they're, they're already sorted, and they're sorted by the, the contribution or the intensity at a point. Uh, at that the, it could be like the pivot point of the object. So we sort the per object, but currently we don't sort the, the, the global ones. But it's, it's in, the, in the plans to do that. And do you have some kind of ETA where it will be uh, available? Uh, could you ask again? Uh, where can we expect this, uh, like solving by distance? Uh, it should be on uh, 1903. Okay, so, yeah. thanks. Hi. So is there any shader for vertex color? Built in right now or some time. Uh, so, what is the question again? If you can write. Is there this. any vertex color shader for the mesh? Not, not the ones we provide by default, uh, but you you can definitely write your custom ones that leverage that. And do you know shader graph supports vertex color? Um, no, ver uh, shader graph currently only supports uh, uh, writing to. Uh, vertex normals, uh, vertex position, and vertex tangents. Uh, you can access vertex colors and then create shaders with them, but you can't do anything with them in the vertex stage of the shader. Thank you. Uh, is HDRP fully deprecated, or <coughs> is there a switch to uh, URP? <coughs> Not at all. It's two different solutions we provide. Um, you should choose the render pipeline depending on your platform and features, but they are both supported. <coughs> okay, thank you. <coughs> uh, 
All right, I guess yeah. that's it. Thank you, everyone. And cool. thank you. You're very welcome to the other talk. Thank you.